From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. Welcome to this JAMA Audio Podcast. I'm Mary McDermott, Deputy Editor of JAMA, and I'm here today with Dr. Johanna Daly of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and we'll be talking about a review in JAMA on the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of malaria in the United States. Dr. Daly, thank you so much for joining me today, and would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Mary. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm uh, Johanna Daly. I'm a professor of medicine in infectious diseases at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center, and a professor of medicine in microbiology and immunology. I have been studying malaria since I was an infectious disease fellow, so I was thrilled to get this invitation. So could we start by having you tell us what is malaria, what causes it, and how is it transmitted? Malaria is actually the illness secondary to a plasmodium infection. So malaria is actually fever, chills, and the symptoms. So it's really the syndrome. And malaria is caused by a plasmodium parasite, which you acquire after you get bitten by a female Anopheles mosquito. She needs blood for her eggs. And so she's probing your skin up and down, trying to find some blood. And during that time, she's accidentally injecting just a handful of sporozoites. And these sporozoites somehow, from the dermis, find a blood vessel and are carried to the liver. And so they set up their first major stage of infection in the liver. And these few sporozoites become millions of merozoites. And this occurs in falciparum over one to two weeks, and you have no symptoms. We actually can't detect that you have them in the liver. You're feeling completely fine. And then in falciparum, people typically get symptoms after they return to the U.S., after they leave the endemic area within 30 days. So in falciparum, they're kind of in a hurry. They come out of the liver as little merozoites, which very quickly invade red cells because they want to avoid the immune system. So within the red cell, which is their new home, they're digesting hemoglobin, they're growing and they're dividing, maybe one to 32. And 48 hours later, they burst open that red cell, merozoites are released, and they quickly reinvade other red cells. So you could see how quickly you go from a very small number of parasites to many. And so that's falciparum, which is the most important malaria because it's prevalent and deadly. The other malarias, Plasmodium vivax, which is about 10%, has an additional stage that stays in the liver. It's a dormant stage. It's called the hypnozoite, and it may stay there for weeks to years later. And so you may have left the endemic area years later, and now you have malaria. So that's true for vivax and ovale. In terms of the other species, malariae, which is more benign, does not have a liver phase, but can also cause illness weeks to years later. And then nolesi, which is the recently identified human malaria, identified in the 1990s. It's a true zoonotic infection, which really is restricted to Southeast Asia because you have a reservoir of macaques. So it has to go from macaque, mosquito to person. There's no person, mosquito, person transmission. Nolesi can also cause very severe disease. So this is a mosquito-borne illness, and that's why preventative measures are around controlling the vector, and then, of course, the medications in case you get infected to kill the parasite at these different life cycle stages. Great. Thank you. Can you discuss how common malaria is in the United States and who is at risk? Well, that's one of the problems, Mary. Actually, malaria is an uncommon infectious disease in the United States. Right now, we're sort of averaging about 2,000 cases a year. And because it's so unusual, it is often overlooked or misdiagnosed. The folks who are at risk for malaria are primarily those who visit the 85 countries across the globe that are endemic for malaria. And occasionally we see cases where there's transmission 
from the mom to the newborn. Occasionally we see cases from blood transfusions. And then there are cases where we can't really figure out where they got malaria. Those are called cryptic malaria, but those are very unusual. Primarily, 90% are from patients who return from an endemic area. And which areas of endemic malaria are the most common where a person returning to the U.S. may have been and is diagnosed with malaria? Africa, by far, seems to be the origin for 80 to 90 percent of our cases that we see in the United States. The level of transmission of malaria in Africa is very high. So even if just a few people visited Africa, their chance of getting infected would be very high as compared to traveling to another endemic part of the world, such as Latin America, South America, where transmission is not as great. Africa is where there's very high transmission and a very high burden of Plasmodium falciparum, which is one of the five malarias. However, you can acquire malaria in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, parts of the Caribbean, South America, Central America, and parts of Asia. So it really remains widespread across the globe. And with that in mind, can you discuss the general approach to preventing malaria in travelers? Right. And I I think, Mary, you're hitting on an incredibly important point. This is a preventative disease. And if people come to our travel clinic, essentially we'll review the itinerary determine whether they're going to a country where they're at risk for malaria, and you have to get somewhat granular. Are they going to a high altitude in that country where there is no infectious mosquitoes? Are they going to an area where in the city there's no malaria? So parts of Latin America, if you're in the city, you're not going to get malaria. So you you have to get granular. What are the exact regions that people are visiting? And then once you decide they may be at risk, I always discuss with my patients preventative measures such as screened accommodations, long sleeve shirts that are permethrin impregnated, and then we can use chemoprophylaxis, which is taking a pill that has a very high success rate of preventing malaria, and that's chemoprophylaxis. And I would say that's the keystone for our patients who are visiting areas, particularly with falciparum and Vivax, some of the more deadly species of malaria. I have to ask you, where does one find long sleeve shirts that are impregnated with pyrethmin? Well, I ask that to myself because I I go to the field a lot. Actually, if you go to the uh, outdoor stores like REI, EMS, they have beautiful, lightweight, fashionable, long sleeves, long pants, and often they are permethrin impregnated. If they're not, you can apply that yourself. Great. Good to know. So can you talk about the typical presenting symptoms of malaria? Right. I mean, all of medicine is based on pattern recognition. And for malaria, this is a challenge. It it is very nonspecific. It's flu-like symptoms, headache, maybe GI symptoms, fever is prominent. So really patients just feeling unwell. Problem is, sometimes they may present with predominantly GI symptoms, diarrhea, belly pain, and that may put you down a different diagnostic thought process. They may come in with pulmonary symptoms. So I would say typically it's fever, and it's really flu-like nonspecific symptoms, and occasionally symptoms that seem to be on a particular organ where you may start thinking about a diarrheal illness or pneumonia. In fact, that could be malaria. And this is the challenge with the misdiagnosis of malaria because patients often look good. Even non-immune patients at the beginning of their presentation look very well. So this is part of the challenge with making the diagnosis. You have to first think about malaria. So when malaria is suspected, what's the diagnostic approach? So the diagnostic approach is to, first of all, uh, have a high degree of concern if malaria is in your differential diagnosis. Most of our patients are non-immunes. 
even our patients who were born and raised in endemic areas or at risk for severe disease. So I already have a slight amount of anxiety because I know things can go not well. So I would make sure I can get a malaria diagnostic as soon as I can. And there's two ways that we can make a laboratory diagnosis of malaria. One is the classic way, which is taking a pinprick of blood, finger stick, making a blood smear and examining that to look for intraerythrocytic parasites. And all clinical labs are certified to do that. There's thick smears and thin smears. Thicks are very sensitive, but take a long time to dry and prepare. Thins, you can prepare very quickly, a little bit less sensitive, but they'll give you the morphology and the parasite load. But you do need an experienced microscopist to do that for you and to do it for you readily. The other thing that we can do is utilize a rapid diagnostic test. It is like a dipstick and it can detect the presence of parasite antigens. You don't really need training for it. You can get it done in 15 minutes. But the downside to the rapid diagnostic is it can detect falciparum, but cannot detect or separate the other three species. Number two, it's not as sensitive. And the non-falciparum species, usually there is a low parasitemia. And number three, it can't tell you what's the parasite burden, because the parasite burden may help prognosticate severe disease in falciparum. So I would say, Mary, the standard for the diagnostics is that we get it readily. And if I don't have it at my hospital, I'm going to put them in an ambulance or tell them to go to the next hospital or find out where they can get a rapid diagnostic test. Gold standard is microscopy, but we could do a rapid diagnostic while we're evaluating those glass slides. The key thing here is to think of it and then to obtain promptly a diagnostic test. So just to clarify what you do in your practice, you always get the rapid test when you suspect malaria and then do go right for the thick smear and wait? We do both. So we do thick and thin because it's easy enough to do. So we do both right away. So if the patient's in the emergency room, the rapid diagnostic is sent off. And then in the meantime, they're preparing both the thin and thick smears. What's the most common malaria species diagnosed in the United States? So of the five species, the most common is Plasmodium falciparum, which is too bad because falciparum is the one that really is associated with most fatalities. So I would say 80 to 90% of malaria in this country is falciparum, again, related to Africa. Most of malaria is contracted in Africa, and most of the malaria in Africa is falciparum. However, the other species are there. So the most common malaria is falciparum, which can be deadly. We always admit a patient with falciparum because they can have a downward turn rapidly. After that, the next most common is Plasmodium vivax, which is about 10% of malaria, more commonly acquired in Asia or Latin America. In this case, you don't really achieve a very high parasite load because it infects reticulocytes, and we don't have that many reticulocytes in the circulating blood. Vivax is less severe disease, but there are case fatalities. So Vivax is also an important illness. After that, there's two other malarias called Plasmodium malariae, Plasmodium ovale. These both result in low-level parasitemia, rarely associated with severe disease. And then there's a true zoonotic malaria called Nolesi, Plasmodium Nolesi. And it's a very interesting fifth human malaria that is really restricted to Southeast Asia because the vector or the reservoir are macaques. And so there's really no mosquito, person, mosquito. It has to go macaque, mosquito, person. So it's still restricted. But Nolesi is deadly as well. Uh, however, we haven't seen very many cases of Nolesi in the United States. But if we see it, it can also cause severe disease. The other thing to say about these five malarias, I always think of falciparum, potentially fatal, typically chloroquine resistant. And then in terms of Vivax and Ovale, once you treat the blood stage, which I know we'll talk about, it has an additional dormant 
hypnozoite stage in the liver that we need to provide a second type of therapy. And given there are five types of malaria, can you comment on treatment? Right. This is sort of another complication of malaria. We have five different species. I told you they have different drug sensitivities. They have different risks for severe disease. But let's start with P. falciparum. That's the majority of malaria in this country. It is potentially fatal. So I'm going to admit that patient. And falciparum became chloroquine resistant quite a while ago. So when I see or hear about a falciparum patient, I'm already thinking I'm not going to use chloroquine and I'm going to use an artemisinin combination therapy. Now, there are still places in the world where falciparum is sensitive to chloroquine, such as Haiti. So that's, you know, something that's sort of special information. But in general, I would be worried about severe illness. I need to hospitalize the patient, and I'm not going to use chloroquine. I'm going to use artemisinin combination therapy. We can also use a tovaquone proguanol for that. In terms of the other species, they're generally chloroquine sensitive. So we can use chloroquine with Vivax, Ovale, Malariae, Nolesi. The thing to know is if you can't figure out the species, because sometimes species identification is difficult, artemisinin and combination therapy works beautifully for all the malarias. So if we can't be sure, we should go to ACT. And if we have more than one species, we should consider using ACT. In fact, about 1% of cases of malaria in the United States have two species. The second part, after we treat that illness, which is in the bloodstream and making the patient ill, we have to remember if they have Vivax or Ovale, they are going to have a second stage that's sitting in their liver that will relapse. Even though you've treated the bloodstream stage, they may relapse. And that's an error people make is they treat Vivax or Ovale with chloroquine or ACT, the patient gets better. However, they forget to treat this other stage and the patient relapses weeks to months later. We have two therapies to treat this dormant stage. Primaquin, which we've been using since 1950, you have to uh, give it for two weeks. And recently, Tofenaquin was developed and FDA approved where you only have to give a single dose. The problem with both of these drugs, Mary, is that you have to test patient's G6PD level, because if they're G6PD deficient, these drugs will be more difficult to use. You will not be able to use tofenaquin, and if they're G6PD deficient, you can still give primaquin, but at a much lower dose, and you're going to observe them for hemolysis. How about severe malaria? Can you comment on what that is and then the treatment? Right. So I think the important thing is recognizing malaria, making the diagnosis, and then determining whether they have severe disease. And I I have reviewed some cases where patients haven't done well, and this is where the error is, is that we need to review the criteria of severe malaria. Because once we decide they have severe malaria, the drug of choice is intravenous artesanate. And so severe malaria is defined by WHO and the CDC website, which is really very, very good, as vital organ dysfunction, perhaps pulmonary disease, hypoxia, ARDS, hypotension, change in mental status, and then a series of laboratory abnormalities such as high lactate, severe anemia, renal insufficiency. And as I mentioned earlier, you can see a patient with severe malaria and sitting in front of you they look non-toxic. They look well. And that's why I think people get fooled. So I think it's very important to then make sure you look at these laboratory criteria as well. They may be a sign that this person actually has severe malaria. Once you decide they have severe malaria, and by the way, any species can do it, although most of them are secondary to falciparum, then we're going to hospitalize them We're going to obtain IV artesanate, which we can talk more about, provide supportive care, watch as their parasitemia comes down, and we then complete their treatment with, once they're taking orally, the parasitemia is less than 1%, we give them a full course of ACT, which is three days of therapy. The other thing to know about severe malaria is 
artisanate, which is clearly the drug of choice, can result in hemolysis a couple of weeks after you treated them. So this is called post-artesanate delayed hemolysis. So you just have to keep an eye on their hematocrit for four weeks after giving artesanate. They can have a delayed hemolytic syndrome. I want to go back to something you said a bit earlier that you admit all patients with falciparum malaria. I was just curious, how long do you keep them hospitalized and when do you know it's okay for them to go home? Right. So we're going to admit all patients. So I first decide whether they have severe disease or not. If they don't have severe disease, they're taking orals. Then I treat them with oral ACT. And the other major point, Mary, is you can admit them. You can write a beautiful note noting why they don't have severe disease. But I have seen patients within 12 hours after admission deteriorate. And if they do, we now have to treat them as severe malaria. So that's the other key thing. Many patients do well. They tolerate their oral medications, their paracetamia declines, and they become clinically well and you can discharge them. So just like any other patient, as patients improve, you can discharge them with follow-up. CDC does say that we should obtain a negative smear upon completion of treatment for all patients with malaria. So you could either do that as inpatient, or if they're doing really well, send them out on orals, and then just make sure we get that negative smear. Got it. Are there any other comments you'd like to make about malaria? No, except to say we've had a case of malaria generally in every state across the United States. Of course, we see more here in New York. I always like to talk about this disease to ER folks, primary care doctors. The second thing to know is artesanate is now commercially available. So if you're in a region where you see a lot of malaria cases, it might be important for your pharmacy to stock artesanate because then it's going to be much easier to use the drug. I think in the past, it seemed to be difficult to get the drug. So I think all hospital systems should perhaps stock it. If they're not stocking it, their pharmacy heads should be aware of how they can get it within 24 hours. It's now commercially available. Other major points, I think, to Fenequin to prevent relapse in our Vivax and Ovali patients is a real breakthrough. They only have to take one dose and not the two weeks, which most patients were unable to do. And again, you have to make sure G6PD is normal. That's pretty much the major breakthroughs I'd say over the last couple of years is Tefenoquin and now the availability of IV artesanate commercially. Thank you so much for that really clear and informative summary of malaria in the United States. I've been speaking today with Dr. Johanna Daly from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine on the topic of diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of malaria in the United States. This episode was produced by Jesse McCorders at the JAMA Network. The audio team here also includes Daniel Morrow, Shelley Steffens, Lisa Hardin, Audrey Foreman, and Mary Lynn Ferkeluk. Dr. Robert Golub is the JAMA Executive Deputy Editor. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.